Good morning. A very warm welcome to State of Europe, Friends of Europe's online festival of politics and ideas. A very warm welcome again to all of you on Zoom and those of you on live stream. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all. And those of you who are frequent um, uh, you know, participants in our State of Europe roundtable will know that we usually were in the hallowed table, round table of the Palais d'Egmont. And because of our circumstances that you're all very aware of, we've created a virtual round table of senior top thinkers, influencers, um, people who have a view and, and have the capacity to make decisions about Europe all in this virtual round table. Just a few uh, issues in terms of just transactional stuff around what you need to do to make sure we can participate. So those of you who are Zoom savvy will know that you need to have your picture on, your video on, make sure you're on mute, but also if you need, if you want to ask a question, make a comment, uh, raise, you know, raise your virtual hand. And those of you who aren't aware where it is, go to the participants box, you'll see a a couple of faces, press on that and you'll be able to find your virtual hand. Those of you, again, on live stream, a very warm welcome to you. Don't, uh, don't worry, you're not left out. If you want to raise a question or an issue or simply be frustrated, make your comment on hashtag State of EU. So use that handle to be able to post your questions and queries um, um, in terms of engaging with this particular debate that we have on this, this first session of the Festival of Politics and Ideas. So. Firstly, just a few words by way of introducing our festival as a whole. Those of you who've seen the programme will know that we're covering all the big ticket issues that we feel deserve and demand our attention. Everything from what's the future purpose of economic growth and the role of GDP? Can we redesign health systems and what requires that to happen? And is there an issue about EU competence in this regard, given where we find ourselves? Can we craft an inclusive, uh, digitalized, um, let's say, sustainable industrial strategy for the future? What will that take and what does that require? What is sovereignty? And um, what we were, we were increasingly referring to in the, uh, in the EU is strategic um, autonomy. What does that mean? And what will that, where will that lead us? And everything from that through to looking at what does actually recovery mean? We're using in, the, in Europe the largest amount of public taxpayers' money to recover. What does that mean and what will that lead to? And how do we ensure accountability and trust at the heart of it? We'll also be discussing issues of racism, what young people want, and everything in between. So it's a full bonanza of issues. It's a big menu to generate and develop big ideas some of which will already be there, but lack the wind behind, the, behind them in terms of actually developing them. Or they might have politics and politicians around them that are either stopping them or need their uh, support. Uh, however, the point is, we are bringing all of you together. We have brought together um, ministers of state, ex-prime ministers. We have uh, you know, heads of departments of government, et cetera, and so forth. We have influencers, commentators, uh, civil society players, all of you. You are all leaders in a virtual room to exchange, connect, and debate the right issues, but think about how we achieve positive social change. That's the most important thing here. And that's what this forum has always been dedicated to, is how do we craft the right type of approaches, ideas, and things to actually work on as we move forward. And that's why this particular Festival of Politics is, is crafted in the way that it is. So before I introduce our first session, I want to say a few words about um, this week as a whole and some data points which I think contour punctuate and create the content and the grit of what we need to be thinking about. Now, in June this year, the IMF predicted and have assessed that world output will shrink by 5% by the end of this year. That's, that was in June. That's before what we know what's happening right now in terms of the second wave that's taking place all across Europe. That, if you think about it, in, they, they said this is the biggest contraction of the world economy since World War II. Just think about that. When we think about the last contraction of world economic output is the Great Recession, recession in 2009. The economy shrunk by 0.1%. 0.1%. At the moment, it's forecasted to shrink by 
5%. So we are talking about significant economic restructuring of the world economy. We mustn't lose sight of that. The other thing is that middle to, um, middle to lower income economies will have shrunk for the first time in, eight, in 60 years. And 89 million people are going to be pushed into poverty. So all of this, and as you most of you know, um, many governments are using their debt and playing in the financial markets to pay for all of this. It doesn't come cheap. At the moment, the ratio of GDP to debt is about 132%. We are up to our eyes in debt into the next five to 10 years. And therefore, that's why this forum, I think those data points are absolutely critical for us to think about as we try and find approaches, solutions, ideas to get us out of this. There are some comparisons being made to the end of the Second World War in terms of how the Teutonic plays of the world economy and society changed. How do we make the most of one of the most significant points of adversity that we're experiencing in our world and in Europe today? So those are data points and issues I think frame the debate across the across this week. We hope that you will enjoy this, uh, find it stimulating, thought provoking, but let's not forget one thing. You are incredible leaders in your own right. The, the, this conversation and this discussion and the generation of ideas depends on your engagement and how much you make of this. There's a lot to be taken for, um, and it's for you to actually participate and engage in this so that we're able to craft a set of ideas. So there we are. That's the kind of the week as a whole. We're going to have moments of culture and art also let's not forget, throughout this week. And we have a resident cartoonist, Tonu, who will be interspersing the conversation with ref re reflections of what all of us are saying. And he he's unabashed in being satirical, cynical, and making us laugh. Because humour is important to say to, to Friends of Europe too, as, as we discuss some of these matters, which are very serious, because we need to keep a, a perspective, if you like. Um, I want to now move on to our first session, um, which is about leadership, governance, and trust. And before I do so, I invite our president, Etienne Davignon, who requires no introduction to any of you, who's a, a, a long-standing figure in Europe, in European politics. I want to be able to just share with you uh, the data from our annual citizens' poll. Those of you who have been to these roundtables before know that for the past two years, three, this is our third year, we have been uh, polling citizens um, across Europe and our poll recently concluded just at the beginning of October and I'd like to share with you a slide on what uh, citizens feel about Europe. We asked them only two questions this year and the first question was if the EU disappeared tomorrow would it make a difference to your life in terms of whether it would make a big difference, slightly better, no, no difference or the same. So I'm just going to get our people to share the slide on there we go. We asked 10,500 Europeans from 11 member states, as you can see from here, and where the life would be better, worse, or the same without the EU. And look at that percentage, the big ball on the left-hand side. 44% it will be worse. But the vast majority are either undecided, think it might be better, or stay the same, or don't know basically. So there's a lot of work to do. This is very consistent with our polling over the past three years, but it's in sharp contrast to what happened last year in the parliamentary elections for the European Parliament, where we saw the largest turnout in two decades, um, where we saw a different atmosphere, uh, but obviously we've been knocked left field as a result of COVID. Let's turn to our first session, leadership, governance and trust. Three concepts, Three concepts and issues which drive modern public policy, and as always have. And it gives me great pleasure first to invite our president, uh, Etienne Davignon, to set the tone and the framework for what we need to be thinking about in this session. President, over to you. Good morning, everybody. I mean, the first thing I would like to say is that we decided at Friends of Europe that uh, COVID would not stop us thinking. So instead of being in the paradigma, which we are, many of you are used to, here we are amongst ourselves online, still capable of thinking and still capable of acting. So thank you all. I think the, the first topic that we have chosen is very important because uh, in this state of confusion, 
confusion relating to the COVID, different measures, different countries, enormous complication to have coordination. We need to have confidence in what we really believe we should do. And I think that is what we will discuss this morning with uh, our two speakers. One, to have uh, in the financial world, have ethics, reliability, and transparency. And of course, we need uh, to understand why trust is so important at this stage of uncertainty. So thank you all and on with the thinking. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for those uh, uh, words of introduction and framing of what we need to be focused on. Um, I'm going to go straight to our first speaker. Um, I'm, I'm really very pleased to have Neri Neri with here. Um, she's the Dean of a school uh, that focuses on governance and economic governance and leadership. Um, Neri, very warm welcome to you. Good um, morning. Good morning. Um, tell us, and I'm going to ask you that hideously difficult question, is that are we entering potentially a governability crisis? Well, um, I think we are facing, a, a, as it were, a crisis of three things. Um, the first is around resilience. What COVID has exposed is the, the, the price in some countries of a decade and some countries of three decades of letting um, housing incomes, health access become extraordinarily unequal in our societies. And COVID has exposed that because huge parts of societies across the world, even in wealthy countries, um, have been left with very little resilience. The second thing it's really exposed is the breakdown in trust and the rise outside of meetings such as this one with the Friends of Europe, where you've got people who probably read similar newspapers and enter into similar conversations what COVID has exposed is the huge gap between this group and others in society and the rise of conspiracy theories, extremism, um, and groups that, that COVID have left even more kind of isolated on social media that, that have really created a rift between government and people. We're seeing this in debates about even if there is a vaccine for COVID, what percentage of people would be willing to actually take that vaccine and believe that it's safe? And the third, the third crisis is one of cooperation. That, you know, that this, this COVID crisis has hit just as the United States and China are resetting their relationship and Europe is finding its way to navigate between those two. And that third thing is really important because to put it simply, we can be in a positive, virtuous cycle, or we can be in a negative, vicious cycle from here. <laughs> Not, um, my video just went off, but anyway. Um, it has. So, so we can hear you, it's okay, go great. on. Great, yeah. So the positive cycle that says that we can all come out of this crisis is one that absolutely depends on each of those three things. You know, it depends on cooperation really working and that means cooperation between Europe, China, the United States and others, whether they have common values or not. It's mm -hmm. gonna to have to be a pragmatic cooperation that makes health provision work and that makes economic recovery work. That will then enable individual governments to work towards a solution. And that will enable economic recovery, which will then um, power better cooperation. That's the virtuous cycle. And going into that, we've seen a couple of things that really have made a difference. What does the evidence tell us about the governance that works in this crisis? Mm. The first is real co cooperation between federal government and subnational governments. Germany is a great example, and so are others. No country, almost no country, is getting this perfectly right. But the countries that are really failing are the countries that are failing to collaborate, to share information with towns and cities and to devolve decisions down to them. A second thing is preparation. You can't govern by focus group. The countries that have done best are the countries that have already had a pandemic and have learned to create patiently the kind of networks and structures to deal with it. A third thing is the countries that have worked best are the countries that have some fat in the system, that have some resilience. 
people focus on whether Sweden and Norway and Denmark have done differently, but what all those countries have in common is decent housing, which means that people are not being pushed together and cross infecting in their homes, quite apart from um, the immediate government policies. So the negative scenario is one where we see countries cling to their differences, both in their cooperation with one another, therefore breaking cooperation down, taking nationalistic responses, which make them less able to deal with the crisis, which loses more trust from their populations, which further increases the polarization and the rise of extremism, which makes international cooperation even more difficult. And that would be the vicious cycle. But let me end by just saying that is not inevitable. At each stage in that cycle, there is a set of decisions that governments can take that can put us on a virtuous cycle where we recover from this crisis and we recover economically. Neri, thank you very much. That was um, huge. Um, you really delved into some of the kind of key strategic issues we need to be considering. And I want to come back to you on that last point, because I'm sure you've, you, you know, for everyone, you've whetted our appetite in terms of the what. Uh, and the how, um, and what's what's possible, um, because I think there's something that you refer to, which is about this crisis, is that it's almost an analogy to health. Those with underlying conditions are attacked more severely. Those economies and structures and governance and member states that have already been weak and uh, to have weaknesses in the system have been hit the hardest too. Um, on that note, Paul, Paul, can I welcome you to this um, uh, roundtable discussion on uh, the issue of leadership, uh, governance and trust? Paul, you are on the subcommittee, you're the chair uh, that deals with tax um, as a matter that is going to generate even more heat uh, than light, uh, especially in the context of the fact that we are using, as I referred to earlier, the largest amount of taxpayer money to bail out Europe. Um, what's your sense of what we need to be thinking about? How do we make sure that the rule of law is taken into consideration in the implementation of the recovery plan? Because at the end of the day, um, how that's spent and what we say about our values in the spending matters. Paul, over to you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, this is why uh, the word trust is, is so important. Um, to start, we have... Uh, somehow awkwardly but given a unique opportunity to put uh, european solidarity in action never had we had this plan uh, before uh, in which we as europe um, help each other uh, trying to uh, go through these difficult times um, and i think when we look back, this will be a decisive moment in, in, in Europe history, European history. It will be a breakthrough or we, we get a backlash. And this is where we are in between. So what we need to achieve um, is spending um, that helps us to recover the economy, restore our societies, recovery, and at the same time make the transition towards sustainability in a broad sense. Um, and that is perfectly doable since the government's in the lead. We get the, exp the spending is from the public side, from the public sector. So we, we are capable of doing it, but it has to be successful in, for recovery and sustainability. And that's uh, uh, quite a daunting task. Um, this is solidarity in action that can work if it brings results. But of course, if it fails, it will have a backlash. The same is true for, uh, for uh, the rule of law. It's now in the discussion. I think there is a relatively weak proposal from, um, uh, from, the, from the German president, uh, presidency. Uh, and uh, what we need here is a much stronger uh, conditions. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, so much stronger conditions on the rule of law. I think that's essential. When I talk to people, um, they are sometimes concerned. I'm from the Netherlands, by the way, where it, mm. we, we fear that the, the Italians uh, squander the money, right? That's one concern. But equally, there's the concern that we spend money on governments that 
do not take the rule of law serious, that do not abide with our values and our institutions, that, uh, inst that condone or even install LGBT free zones, uh, inflict on the freedom of media, uh, um, make the judges dependent rather than independent and so on. So this is crucial for a feeling of trust. Solidarity is a two-way street, right? Um, so people want to be, uh, want to have this solidarity, but then again, it must be a reciprocal. Uh, it must be, a, it must be a two-way street. Uh, so th this is where I think, so in the end, it's either, a, it's a breakthrough, it's a unique opportunity, but we have to make sure there is not a backlash. Money needs to be spent well, it leads to a recovery, including sustainability, but also the countries that, uh, that, enter this fund of solidarity must obey the, the rule of law. Now, this okay. is the, 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 at this moment the fight in the European Parliament, or as I said, the European Parliament fights to bring this in uh, since the proposal by the German president the CS2 week. Sure, Paul. I'm going to bring our president in, but one of the things that, uh, before I do, um, all that you said is known, understood. You're a parliamentarian. What are you going to do about this? You get a sense, actually, that um, everyone says the same thing when you speak to uh, commissioners, uh, others, and everyone says, yeah, rule of law. It, you get a sense of who's in charge? How do we make this happen? So um, you want to think about that question? Because, you know, people, no. you've heard what we've heard from citizens, right? But you'll be forgiven, if, if I may, to say, that actually, that Everyone's been talking about rule of law for donkey's ages, actually, but how do we make it stick? But before you answer, I want to bring in our president, uh, Etienne Davignon. Mr. Davignon. I think the, the role of the European Parliament is absolutely essential. Because we have this rule of unanimity on these type of issues, which is bad, mm. but is a fact, uh, the Council of Ministers can be blocked easily in terms of the decision. But it has to be a joint decision with the parliament. So the parliament has to stick to its guns. So as to oblige to do what is right. And conditionality on the rule of law is right and indispensable. So what's your view on union activity? Do we need to shift that one? This, is it the time now to really go for qualified majority type of approaches? Because otherwise, we're never going to shift away from the politics of the East and the West. I mean, that, that, that's a, a debate and it's dangerous because then one says, as long as one has not solved this, one can't do anything. Right. I think here we are in a dialogue with the European Parliament. The European Parliament can put conditions on approving the budget and so on and so forth. Is it ready to do so? It can put pressure on the, on the council, which then has to find a compromise. Okay. But it will only find a compromise if there is enough pressure on them. And that is the question I'm asking. Is that mm -hmm. well understood inside the European Parliament? Not shifting blame, mm -hmm. but shift how do you proceed in an effective manner? Paul, how much noise can you make and how much solidarity can you achieve within to do what uh, our president was just saying? Paul, over to you. Well, I think we can do a lot as the European Parliament. We are, are on the negotiation table um, and what we now need is a counter-proposal from the European Parliament, including the rule of law. Um, I, I think there are three issues. Um, it's, it, it's the budget, of course, uh, but it's also the, the the own resources that we need to finance the budget, not just now, but also later. And it's the rule of law. And the European Parliament has to come up with a counter proposal and start negotiating. Now, I won't say it will be easy, right? I think the pressure on the European Parliament from the government leaders, but also from the population that wants mm. the money for recovery to protect their jobs will be, will be high, huge. So I don't think it will be easy, but I think it's certainly doable if, uh, if we can get the European Parliament to come up with a with an solid counter proposal and start negotiating with the Council. That's the, this the, 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 the situation of the game we're, we're now in. And like I said, I think it's crucial because five or ten years from now, we will look at this moment as a decisive moment. I have no, uh, I have no doubt about that. 
Um, so in that sense, I'm, I'm optimistic that we are, we are in a position to bring uh, a better rule of law mechanism on the table. Okay, so you, you feel that you are able to muster the power around you. Last uh, question to you um, is about taxation. Um, where do you think we'll end up on taxation in, in, if, in, in Europe in the future? Uh, that's an interesting question, really. Um, for, for the audience, I started my work on tax avoidance when I was member of national parliament in 2007. Mm -hmm. So you imagine the Dutch parliament discussing tax avoidance. Uh, <laughs> you said <I> that. <laughs> <laughs> so, in, so I was then what I was a sole voice, but you see it, of course, growing. People become aware, and it's not just about the the redistribution. Uh, uh, it's also a matter of fairness or or trust. So you want people very much want a system where. If you have a rule, everyone applies, to, uh, uh, obeys that rule. So it's not what people find deeply unfair is that uh, we have one set of people and companies that do pay taxes and one set who does not. People find this totally unfair. This is why it's correct. Now, I remember because after the credit crisis, after the euro crisis, we saw an impetus for changing slowly, too slowly, of course, but it changing system. I have no doubt that in the years to come, uh, the focus now is on spending, the focus will shift to revenue, and we will see breakthroughs in, uh, in, our, uh, in, our, in our tax system, and they are needed. First of all, you need to crack down on tax avoidance, including the EU tax havens, uh, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, and Ireland, right? Um, including also the jurisdiction outside Europe. Remember that half of the wealth that is hidden in these jurisdictions outside Europe, um, half of this, like Bermuda and, and Bahamas, half of this wealth is owned by the rich. And I don't mean the 1%, I mean the 1% of the 1%. It's that unequal. Uh, so we have a crackdown on tax avoidance, but we also need to green the tax system, of course. That's essential if we want to make this move towards sustainability. And in the end, we have to reform our, uh, our corporate tax system. It comes from the early, uh, early in the 20th century. It's completely outdated, thanks to globalization and digitalization. So we need to reform it. So these elements, tax avoidance, screening, and reform uh, will be on the tables in the year to come. And is that something you, you as a committee are going to be working on in terms of putting forward proposals about how this might happen? Yeah, absolutely. And not just how it might happen. Uh, I think there are already good proposals on the, uh, on the table. But also uh, my experience in, in, in finding tax avoidings bring information on the table. This can't stand the light of day. Um, so bringing information, new information in the public debate is already very helpful. It's one of the reasons why the European Parliament has always been very focal on what is called country by country reporting. Let the corporates tell where they make profits and where they pay taxes. That's all. And you will see the world will change. Thank you for that, Paul. Um, I'm going to bring in, uh, there are three people who have already signaled that they want to come in to this con conversation with particular, uh, as I said, this is not a, simply about deconstructing what we understand, but actually coming up with ideas and solutions and finding common ground to move us forward. I want to ask uh, Juan Menendez from Eurofund. You've come up with some research, I believe, that you'd like to share with us um, in this regard. Over to you, Juan. Very warm welcome. Hello, I, I hope that you are uh, hearing me well because I had some problems with my computer and I am connected with my phone, but I hope that it's okay. You are very clear. Welcome. Okay. Uh, yes, we have done uh, um, two round surveys uh, on just explain life. Explain your organization. Can yes, you okay. Eurofound is, the, Eurofound is the, the European Union agency that uh, um, provides knowledge in the area of social and employment policies. So we do research and we uh, run, among other things, service in the European Union across all member states. And in the, in, the, in the middle of the crisis, we went out with an online survey uh, that we call Live Work and COVID. Uh, and we have done two rounds. Uh, the first results were published around uh, April and we have a second round uh, published recently with data up to July. And among other things, 
we we collect data um, about the uh, trust of, of the citizens uh, in the institutions, uh, particularly the national governments and the European Union. Basically, we know from previous research, because part of these questions are based on, on, on previous surveys, that uh, trust depends highly on, on the capacity to deliver of, of the mm -hmm. institutions, of the public services. Uh, was the European Union and were the governments delivering during the, the, the mid of the crisis? So the first reaction was one where uh, the, the, the citizens reported relatively high trust or higher trust in their national governments, but it was a huge drop in trust in the EU, particularly in the countries that they were hit by the pandemic first, Italy, mm -hmm. Spain, France, uh, um, among others, really, yeah. really low. And that reflected the huge debate at the time that was uh, mentioned before about the reaction of the European Union. Big difference. Uh, if we look at the second round, it would be interesting to know now that we are in the middle or in the, uh, in the growing of a second wave. But uh, uh, in July, end of July, uh, there was a rebound. In, in between, we have the agreements in the European Union on what can be uh, considered a big reaction, joining forces. So we see how uh, trust in the European Union grew again. And the, the national governments, there was some deterioration also because of the management probably in, in some countries. However, this was not um, across all member states. And here we are a bit concerned, and I am entering a bit in the area of interpretation about uh, the divides created by, by, by certain narratives. We saw that this happened in the countries that first uh, were most hit by the crisis, but we saw that the, 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 the so-called frugal countries that they were um, um, fighting or, or um, uh, criticizing the waste of, of, of the monies, that uh, trust in the European Union dropped. Um, so it's, it's okay. an issue about, about actions, but about narratives. And the, a, a concern here is about if we have learned something about previous crises, for example, the narrative in the UK previous to Brexit, creating mm. divides in Europe that uh, give the, 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 the perception of winners and losers depending on the decisions that they are taking. Thank you. So clearly a message from that is that we need to make sure that the leaders are able to play ball, but in a way that creates a, a better new narrative about solidarity in different ways. Thank you for that. Uh, and, and very much appreciate your co contribution. Lewi Yo, welcome. Our next contributor. Lewi? I just, uh, just posted a question to say that we have been talking about the problems you have faced, the lack oh, of trust. Lewi, can you introduce yourself first and then oh, your hi. question? Yes. Uh, I'm Lewi Yo from the, the EU Centre in Singapore. Uh, have been running events, trying okay. to get Singaporeans to know more about the EU. Uh, it's not, a, not an easy job. But yes, my, my question and, and my comments is that we have more or less identified the problems we have now in terms of the lack of cooperation because of the lack of trust and lack of leadership and all that. But I'm wondering whether we could spend some time to try and brainstorm what, how, what we can do uh, to rebuild trust and what type of leadership is needed uh, during this kind of uh, uh, very complex and, and in, 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 in this kind of uh, situation we are in now. So, really, so that's why you're here. That's why you're here. What I'm saying is that's why you're here. That's what this is. Yeah. What's the purpose of this forum is to not simply think about oh my God the chest beating of all the problems. It's actually, coming up with what would you do. What do we yeah. need to do? What are the specifics? And therefore, if you've got thoughts, and I will say this to all of you, um, in case you're not able to get in, use the uh, chat function, note down your thoughts, questions and issues, and we'll collect all of that if you're not able to come in. But also people can react to it because this is uh, the forum for discussion and ideas. So I want to move to Mary. Mary Fitzgerald, one of our European young leaders, a very warm welcome very to you. Welcome. Introduce, Introduce yourself, yourself and what your question or contribution is about. Good morning, everyone. Mary Fitzgerald. I'm a journalist and Libya specialist, a European young leader as part of a Friends of Europe uh, project and also a trustee of Friends of Europe. 
And the point I would like to make, we're, we're talking about leadership here, but I think it's also important to remember the, the swell of sentiment that we saw in Europe between March and May, June, during the lockdowns, that, that community swell of solidarity, of resilience, a sense of, of community building. And I think it's really important that as we face into what is likely to be a very difficult winter uh, for member states across Europe, that we don't lose sight of that moment we had and we don't squander the opportunity to build on that energy and swell we saw during the spring and during that first wave of, of COVID. I think there's a real danger of that now. So I would argue yeah. that what we need to see is in addition to leadership on the level of the EU institutions and, and national leaders and member states, we need a better synergy between those leaders and the communities they represent. And it's up to the leaders not to waste that opportunity. The other point I would like to make is that I think there is a danger here that we see a slipping into some of the trends we were seeing pre-COVID in Europe, particularly when it comes to um, member state leaders, even um, uh, senior figures within EU institutions, mainstreaming what was once upon a time seen as far right rhetoric on a whole range of issues, including um, immigration. Europe is facing into what, as Darmendra outlined earlier with the latest figures, it's going to be a very tough economic period uh, for mm -hmm. Europe. The danger is that we see leaders looking for scapegoats and a further mainstreaming of rhetoric and, and as I said that was a pattern we were seeing before uh, COVID and I think we really must bear in mind the need to avoid um, that happening and focus again on that sense of building a community. Pre-COVID there was a lot of talk about how do we create a sense of European demos, a sense of European solidarity, European identity across the continent. Many would argue that such an opportunity comes at a moment of crisis, but it's up to leaders to seize the opportunity that a crisis represents. Mary, what would you do? Imagine you've got the opportunity because what you're saying, and I'm challenging everyone to this because we can, we can, you know, talk till cows come home, but, but there's an issue about if you had the opportunity, what was the one in terms of that point that you made about better synergy, better engagement, what, what if you had the, the opportunity, um, what would you do if you had the ear of, uh, the president uh, of the commission, Ursula, what would you say to her to do? Well, I think a key part Sorry, of this, I, and I'm, I think a key part of this, and I was happy to see that this will be one of the sessions at State of Europe this, uh, this week, is a focus on the intergenerational. Um, the, mm -hmm. the, the conversation happening between older generations in Europe and younger, because there has been a bit of a rupture happening there. It's happening globally, but it's happening in Europe. And the reason it's, it's particularly important in Europe is if you look at our demographic uh, trends, we will be a predominantly gray continent very, very soon. So it's imperative mm -hmm. to build those relations between the, the generations and reach out more to that younger generation um, that as we've seen surveys have shown is not really as aware of the European project, where it has come from, where it might be going as, as they could be. So I would suggest that there is a, a focus on that, but we focus on building that sense of European identity, but using the tool of intergenerational conversations. Thank you, Mary. We have um, a question posted on um, the social media on Twitter. Alex, I want to invite one of our, our colleagues. Alex, you have a question or an issue to be raised by one of our live stream viewers. Alex, over to you. Yes, I do. Thank you, Dharmendra. So the question Welcome. from the public is, how can the European Union ensure that big companies are taxed as thoroughly as its citizens? And is there a way to ensure that the money from the taxation of such companies can be used for greener and more sustainable causes? Thank you, Alex, a very topical, topical issue. And again, this is not a classic conference. It's not about a two, two and four. Any of you can respond to that, don't forget. You are all in leadership roles. So any of you who've got views on that, please come back to that. But can I invite our president, um, um, uh, Etienne Davignon, do you have any views or comments on what you've heard so far about this conditionality point, what we've just heard from the public um, about how do we make sure companies pay that it goes to the right place? And Paul, you may wish to come in also. Actually, Damendra, I'll come in too. Excellent, thank you. 
I'd like to listen first. Okay, uh, Neri, over to you first and then yeah. Paul. So I think there's three things that, that governments and companies can do um, on the tax front. And the, you know, the first is corporate boards need to take responsibility, not just for ensuring that companies pay legal tax, but that their tax, that they don't pursue aggressive tax minimization schemes, that they that they don't do tax schemes, that their tax arrangements are actually in compliance with the spirit of the law. So corporate boards are one thing. Digital business is the other that the European Union is working on. Digital business has to pay tax commensurate with what non-digital business pays. And that we need to see more action on. And the third that people don't focus on enough is that tax officers, the tax enforcement needs to be mm. properly funded, properly modernized, properly renovated at the national level. That, mm. the, that, and that this issue is really important for public fairness and a sense of public fairness. The other thing, if, if I might, um, Lei Wee was talking about, you know, what do we actually do, you know, other than on tax? And I, I think here, there are two playbooks in Europe, as Paul said, there's the investment playbook and there's the austerity playbook. And the people that want the austerity playbook, the frugal, as it were, are thinking about the waste of money that was done in the 1970s. The people that want the investment playbook are thinking about the extraordinary way that governments invested after the Second World War. So yeah. let's learn the lessons from the Second World War, which are about actually political conditionality, but were also about massive redistribution to prevent communism taking over. And so let's learn from that playbook and invest as was done after the Second World War. Last Mary quick comment, Mary, on, Mary made on. the point, what should, what should ab about leadership? To me, there's a test of leadership that we're seeing around the world. Our leaders giving crystal clear communication. The countries that are failing are seeing two things happening. One, muddled and changing messages from the leadership and two, the public sense that the rules don't apply to everybody. It's crucial that leaders are not just clear, but they enforce the rules for everybody on COVID management and that includes on themselves. Mary, that's a tall order, as you know, from our experience, even in your backyard, you know, look what Boris is up to, uh, given, uh, you know, being almost like Trump in drag in the UK, as well as others uh, behaving with lack of clarity and consistency. Uh, but very specific uh, examples you've given there, which people might want to respond to. What do you think about what the European Parliament could do about the boards? What do we do about ratcheting up the digital, uh, digital uh, tax um, uh, uh, arena? Uh, and, you know, that really important point that whilst the, the threat of communism was writ large, Post Second World War, the biggest issue, if we get this wrong, between the you know the frugals and the investors, is the rise and the momentum behind nationalism, and we could see that that might be a, a very serious con a consideration as we uh, look ahead in the next five years. When you think of the context of the public budget, I suggested um, earlier, that could be a real consequence for those who are on the poor end of the uh, the wedge, if you like. Um, so, did you want to make a comment on any of you? Anything you've heard so far? Commander. No, I think it makes a lot of sense. Great. Okay. Commander. So, I'm... can I jump in on the on the taxation issue? Of course, Paul, of Paul. Yeah, I just all I heard was Damendra, and okay. I just need to say it's Paul. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Welcome back. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. No, no, no. And and I said I think transparency is crucial in this debate. So that's that. Uh, mm -hmm. But I already mentioned that point. What we need also in the end is a change in the in the the rules of the game. So if you want to have a fair game, sometimes you need to rethink the rule. In the current tax system, uh, some corporates have found a way to decide where they pay tax, uh, where they make profits, and where they pay taxes. And they usually pay the taxes in countries and jurisdictions with a low marginal tax rate. That puts a lot of pressure on uh, on the countries and, uh, and jurisdictions. That leads to the race of the bottom. So you need to turn it around and say, okay, the countries decide uh, again where uh, the, the corporates pay taxes. And there is a proposal already from the European Commission and supported by the European Parliament, which is mm -hmm. called CCCTB. It's difficult. It's a common consolidated corporate tax base. And this is exactly with this rule, the, the countries decide where corporates make profits and where they pay taxes. And like I said, it's not just about, um, uh, about redistribution. This is the matter of fairness that's so crucially important. Mm. We need to have um, 
the same rule applies to everyone. That's the, uh, this, uh, the, the condition for building trust. And this is, goes throughout this crisis. Um, if we want to make trust grow, it's about clear communication, even though there are big uncertainties. But also we need to let trust grow by achieving results. And this is why I say that this moment when we look back will be a breakthrough or a backlash. It's now the time to be, uh, to not just have the words, but also the actions that mm. people can learn to trust. And this is a new ball game, but economic policy has been about budgetary restrictions on deficits, on debt, and mm -hmm. complex. It was focusing uh, very much on the financial, uh, financial uh, effect imposed financial conditions. Now we have to rethink, and that's an interesting, on how to spend money. That's very differently. So it's an investment program and how to make sure that this investment is, uh, is effective. And I very much hope this will also lead to, in, n n not within the Brussels bubble, but in everywhere throughout Europe, how can, are we going to modernize our economies? That's, that's what that's like. So we needed, the, uh, I hope very much for a, fair, a change in the policy debate, how to modernize the economies, including sustainability, including mm -hmm. fairness. This is the moment to do it. And I very much hope for this debate. Thank you, Paul. I'm just going to bring invite our president in. But the one thing that you re referred to about the tax avoidance, there's a nimbyism, not in my backyard, because actually Ireland, yourself, the Netherlands and others actually cherish the fact they've got tech giants or they've got money being put in different ways in terms of tax receipts. And that means being able to sort of say, actually, I'll give that up a little bit because I want a common good. President, over to you. I think there are two different issues. There's the first issue, which is an immediate issue, which relates to the conditionality of the rule of law. Mm -hmm. I think that is a f very fundamental first issue, is that there is no solidarity without common rules, and mm -hmm. common rules mean what you've just said. That is the debate of the moment. Once we have come forward on that, the role of the European Parliament is crucial, we then have the whole debate on what does uh, fiscal policy mean inside the European Union? How do the various countries, which are sovereign in terms of tax, mm. decide what level of coordination in relation to what is the tax base and so on and so forth? It's another debate. It's an important debate, but don't have to separate one from the other. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. We have another, uh, well, firstly, I want to bring in um, Chris De Meyer. Chris? Hi, I'm here. Sorry, my phone's Hello. just Do ringing. introduce yourself. Um, so I'm Chris De Meyer. I'm a neuroscientist. I work at King's College London. And I work on understanding the, the brain drivers of polarization and opinion fragmentation in the real world as it's happening wow. right now. We've got, well, you've got our attention completely. Go on. Um, so one of the things that I do is I, I just mm -hmm. don't do research. I also do a lot of interventions based on that. And the, one of the big difficulties or, or issues that I see underlying this breakdown of trust and uh, clear communication is an inability for people with different practices and different professional roles to break through their silos and to communicate effectively and collaborate across those silos. So we spend with my colleagues, we spend a lot of time on building bridges between people with different perspectives, on getting them to collaborate more effectively. And, and that is a Chris, different... Chris, if I can interrupt just for a second. When you say people, who, who, what do you mean by people? Um, uh, not a stupid question, just so we understand. Who is it you're trying to build bridges between? Uh, so everyone. So people with different professional practices. So either scientists and policymakers or policymakers from different departments or policymakers and business people or policymakers and, and citizens. So okay. any kind of group of people that has a certain way of thinking about a problem and certain way of, of tackling a problem. And if they then come in contact with another group who thinks about that problem differently, you automatically get a fragmentation and, and, an, and a sort of an entrenching of positions of how to work together uh, on those issues, including an issue like immigration as we just saw the cartoon come up there. 
Um, so one of the things that we're trying to do is to, to accelerate the way by which people can effectively collaborate together. And there are good processes for that. And those processes are usually not putting people around the table and letting them differ of opinion with each other. There is mm -hmm. another set of processes that you can use okay. by which you structure the interaction so that we tunnel faster through those disagreements of opinion that we have on the abstract level and we find the, the points of connection at a more concrete level, at a level of what can we now start doing about this particular problem. So break down big abstract problems about which debates can keep on going on forever into much smaller actionable things where you can actually find groups of people that can start doing things together around those particular issues. And also, so before you go, so that's great. So you, it sounds like you've got a really, uh, uh, a fabby idea there in terms of what perhaps we should be taking this on board in terms of what we do across the EU. In terms of what you've been doing, have you been doing it best in the UK or across the EU or where? Who have, who have you had kind of support and traction with on this? Because I'm, I'm, you know, we're, we're a great believer in, um, you know, the impact of neuroscience and what it teaches us and shows us in terms of policy making. So just share with us your some sort of thoughts about how we take some of that forward. Um, so we've been mostly doing this in the UK here, um, but we are uh, looking into trying some of this in, in sort of the continent as well, in, in uh, continental Europe as well. And um, the communities by which we have most been doing this are scientists and policymakers in the area of climate change or okay. local policymakers and, and people working on the net zero transition at a local level or even local communities, people from local communities trying to work together with a local council uh, and so on. So anything from the local policy level to the international policy level, we've been experimenting with this and getting good results. Could you do us a favor in the context of this being a discussion forum and ideas forum, could you post on the chat where people can get further information, what your results show us and how we might, those of you who are interested, take some of this thinking and ideas forward. I'm gonna to move to, and thank you very much for your contribution. It was well, really well, well, well received. Paul, Paul Taylor. Um, one of our senior fellows. Well, a warm welcome to you, Paul. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, Do introduce yourself and your question for the benefit of others. So I'm, I'm Paul Taylor. I'm a, a senior fellow with Friends of Europe and a columnist with Politico uh, and uh, a, a sort of uh, long-standing journalist on European affairs. And it seems to me that we're approaching a crunch moment um, in the COVID uh, crisis where governments are, are going to have to decide in Europe how much uh, to invest in the future, as it were, and how much to spend on protecting workers in jobs now. And mm. I think those are going to be very, very difficult decisions. And to come back to Nairi Woods' important point about learning the lessons of past crises, um, there will be huge political, social pressures to protect people in jobs that may never come back. Uh, this is how our, our, our system works, how our trade unions work, how our media work. Uh, I, I, there's a tiny example at the moment in France, which is very typical, uh, of a Japanese tire factory, uh, which the uh, owners want to close. And there is a massive national battle uh, uh, engaged to try and save uh, the factory, whether or not it's economically viable, you know, doesn't really figure in that discussion. Mm. Uh, you know, when you, you, you project that debate over the whole of Europe and over the whole of our economies, who's going to decide, who's going to be able to say which sectors have a future, which sectors have no future, which sectors can be transformed and at what stage uh, uh, to stop uh, the, the really vital um, job retention schemes that exist at the moment to keep people uh, who are unable to work uh, in sectors that have been shut down by COVID, uh, such as hospitality or uh, others, uh, in their current jobs, and to what extent and when you allow the shakeout. Um, in Europe, traditionally, Nordic countries have done better at protecting the worker rather than the job. And in a lot of yeah. other societies, um, dead end jobs, money, you know, public money has gone into protecting 
what are essentially or preserving dead end jobs uh, uh, for too long. Um, but to come back to the leadership point, I think that's where European yeah. leaders within the European Council, with the support of the European Commission um, and of Parliament, which I think will be more difficult because Parliament naturally wants to protect it wants to protect its voters, although it's also more idealistic, perhaps about uh, greening Europe and about uh, 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 digitalizing Europe. Um, that's where leaders will need to build trust among each other, among themselves, so that they can uh, support each other in the tough decisions that will have to be made uh, to pull, pull the plug slowly or, or, or rapidly uh, on sectors and jobs that are, now, you know, un, are unlikely ever to come back or that uh, public policy should not want to come yeah. back. Yeah. And uh, uh, to make sure that the recovery fund money is used really on the jobs of the future. I think that's going to be very hard. And I think it'll only work if European governments and institutions support each other uh, rather than each sort of uh, floundering in their own domestic uh, arena. But, but that is what's going to happen, Paul. Thank you for that. But the reality is uh, the European Commission doesn't have a, an EU-wide economic dashboard in terms of where the problems are, what the issues are, because the data sharing doesn't take place. There is what we've witnessed, a sense of protectionism and meism. And um, one of the things that kind of occurs to us at Friends of Europe is that people aren't just getting the fact that everything fundamentally changes given the economic shock. And I, I presented those figures, they're only going to get worse. It's about what time, at what stage do leaders get real that this isn't just for us playing politics as we've always done, but actually, this is serious stuff. And we really need to rethink both structure, ways of negotiation, and actually what, what's at stake in their economies. So have a thought, thought about that. I'm going to bring in David McNair. David? Please introduce yourself. And we'll Hi there. Yeah, my name is David McNair. I work at the One Campaign, which is a campaign focused on uh, fighting poverty, particularly in, in Africa. Your question, your issue. Uh, well, I, was just, I just wanted to agree with Chris. You know, I, I grew up in Belfast in the 1980s. And uh, after 25 years living there and also a PhD on segregation, my conclusion was that this kind of very, um, you know, easy way of putting people in boxes and kind of mistrusting them and kind of assuming things about them was a key yeah. of the conflict. But actually, um, you know, the, the, th the fora to bring people together need to be very well funded and very and actually some of the most successful stuff that happened during that period was funded by the EU. It was basically women's community groups who looked at the things that united them rather than divided them. And that was important at the grassroots level, but it's hard work, it's long-term, and it needs to be very, very intentional and well-funded. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is that one of the things is, though, David, is that we don't tend to learn, do we, that well, that things like that and other parts of Europe, we've not been able to create some sort of um, a, a evaluative framework that helps us think about um, what worked in the past so that we can actually use it now. And what you're saying, I suppose, one of the ideas is that how do you kind of fund, how can the EU, alongside funding jobs and investment, etc., that a necessary investment is in the type of approach that Chris and you are talking about that's neuroscience based about creating the opportunities to build bridges and take people together on what is going to be the sharpest incline in society over the next five years. Um, Karen Smith, a warm welcome to you. Introduce yourself. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, good morning. Yeah, my name is Karen Smith, and I'm, uh, I, well, I teach international relations at Leiden University, and I'm also serving as the special advisor to the UN Secretary General on the responsibility to protect. So I wanted to just, you know, add another topic to, you know, a, a, I, I guess a growing list of topics that we already have on the table. But, yeah. you know, I just wanted to appeal to, to decision makers and, and everyone around the table when you're thinking about, European responses to the current crisis. I mean, it's, you know, I think it's understandable and we've seen states increasingly, you know, look inward and, and, and obviously focus first and foremost on their, I guess, domestic situations, um, uh, you know, the, the dire financial uh, situation that we find ourselves in. And, and I think what we've seen happening 
is that there's both now a, a lack of capacity and in many cases, a lack of willingness to assist other states in building this resilience that we've heard mentioned uh, today as well against, particularly against atrocity crimes, which of course is, you know, my concern. Um, and I think, you know, we've also seen an increasing lack of willingness to respond to atrocity crimes that are imminent or occurring. And, and this of course has potentially disastrous consequences for, for those people who are most in need of protection. Um, and maybe, you know, just one case in point, we're seeing in Europe and elsewhere with the closing of borders as a response to the crisis, you know, we're seeing thousands of refugees facing a really precarious situation where they're unable to flee from conflict or persecution, or they're finding themselves in limbo in, in refugee camps. Um, and if we're looking at states where, and, and this was mentioned before, I think by Professor Woods as well, you know, where we see underlying risks existing, including conflict, uh, weak state structures, uh, high levels of socioeconomic uh, inequality, et cetera, et cetera. This crisis that we're currently experiencing is, of course, further increasing the risk of, of atrocity crimes. And, well, and um, also, Karen, if, Karen, if I may, I'm sorry, sorry to um, interrupt you there, sure. but um, you're, you're an advisor, as you said, to the UN, right? Yeah. Okay, so what what what's the UN going to do? What, what's your role? Is is there? Do we are we facing um, the the fact that the UN does it actually have the relevance anymore? Because when you talk about what you do, we know this, but people will look up at multilateralism and look at the UN and think actually, are you relevant anymore? What were you, what are you going to do about this in terms of your advice and what can be done? Sorry to be so challenging, but you know these are these are the stakes are high. No, absolutely. And I mean, I agree with you, you know, we're in a year where we're marking the 75th anniversary of the UN. So I think that's a that's a you know fair question to be asking. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, the UN, as we know, is, is very much constrained by its its members, which are states. And I think here again, it's it's really important for Europe as a as a as a powerful block within the United Nations to also take the lead. So when mm -hmm. we're talking about leadership, um, you know, there's there's talk about the vacuum due to uh, the U.S. retreating a little bit from multilateralism. Sure. We see other states moving into the space um, whose values are perhaps not, not those um, that we associate with the U.N. necessarily when it comes to things like promotion of human rights, um, protecting vulnerable populations. So here I think it's really, really important for, for Europe to step up and say, well, yes, we're all going through this crisis. Clearly, we need to be focusing on uh, Europe and the recovery of Europe, the, the economic recovery of Europe. But at the same time, these risks are not going to go away. So when we see conflict and risk of atrocities in other countries, this is going to have implications for Europe in the near future. Um, and so, you know, we all we've all heard that prevention and early action, you know, sure. make sense, not just from a moral perspective, but um, also from a financial perspective. So, so I just want yeah. to appeal to people who are, you know, involved in making these decisions that in considering national, regional, and global responses, you know, we shouldn't forget that governments don't only have a responsibility to protect you know, the health and the financial well-being of their populations, um, but also to protect them from, and other populations in other states, from atrocity crimes. And here maybe, sorry, I'm talking a lot, but I just want to add one more point, and that was made earlier, the point about the rise in hate speech in Europe. Um, and, and also, you know, so just that point that, all of us are at risk of uh, the potential of atrocities occurring. And I think states really need to come down hard um, on pol especially political leaders who are not just sanctioning hate speech and incitement to violence, but actually promoting it themselves. I'll okay, start. thank you. No, thank you. But the, the, the message there really is also the fact that here's an opportunity that if we can use this comparator in terms of the economic crash um, of the post world, Second World War situation and what happened in rebuilding the world and Europe, there's an opportunity for Europe to use this moment to really uh, fill that void, the vacuum uh, that's been left by, let's say, the US and others uh, to actually really move in and make, I suppose, the UN work differently and better and more relevant to this 21st century context we find ourselves in. Something that you may wish to respond to and uh, please do use the chat function, as I said. I want to move to Kensika. Kensika, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Thank you very much for asking me, to, for putting me on the spot. <laughs> Really, please, I think. Um, yes. Do introduce yourself, Kensika, please. Oh, I'm Kensika Moshengo. I'm, um, I'm with the Immigrant Council of Ireland, as then 
I'm trying now, what, what I'm doing uh, basically as an integration officer for the moment, I'm trying to get um, migrant to uh, positively act um, in the political ar uh, arena. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a lot of um, a webinar for migrants to participate politically. So that's what I've been doing recently. And I think um, I, have a, I've, I don't have a lot to say today, but uh, I just want to reiterate the fact that uh, there in Ireland, uh, we have uh, in the past, we were boosting saying that um, there's no uh, right wing, uh, official right wing party. You know, we don't have uh, um, like in, in the rest of Europe. But recently, as, um, as Karen actually mentioned, there is a rise of hate speech and we're seeing that uh, more and more um, groups are organizing themselves in, in, in a, you know, with a um, very disturbing uh, discourse um, that we, we're hearing. Sure. It's something that we didn't see in the past. So I think in terms of, um, that's one point, that's a very major point that I wanted to make today is something that we didn't see before and we're seeing now. So again, um, if I want to, if I want to bring that, uh, this, uh, if I want to bring the the conversation back to Europe, I'll say that um, the sense of being European. Um, when I, I'm talking about migrants here, uh, those who are maybe first or second generation, we need really to reinforce that idea that people should perceive themselves as being part of that wide uh, European space that people should feel that they are free to, to, to really move freely within that space. Because we still have, um, I'm talking about, uh, I'm talking uh, from the point of view of a migrant, um, people feel that um, they still, okay. of course, they are uh, linked to the place where they, they, they landed or where the children are born. But that idea of being part of Europe is still something that we need to, to raise awareness about. Indeed, but I suppose, thank you for that, and that's important, but there's two points there that perhaps people want to respond to. Is, what about the tech giants whose share, shares have soared? They're the only winners in this game at the moment. They have become, they've got the hugest gains uh, out of this uh, particular environment. What do we do about that? And what, what's their responsibility? And secondly, when, uh, can think of the point you make about migrants, you know, Europe is built, its, its prosperity is built on migration. And what, what I suppose frustrating, frustrating is those migrants who've come from the 50s onwards or even before don't seem to reach out their hands to those who are on the shores of Europe how do we that's not to shift responsibility is only only theirs but actually how do we create that community of diaspora that can actually bolster some of the arguments because there are some very very wealthy migrants in Europe in positions of power who could be speaking out more about this issue rather than forgetting where they came from I'm going to invite Frederic Vallier yes Frederic. can you hear me I can hear you. Good morning, okay. a warm welcome. Please do introduce yourself and your yes. question. Uh, I'm Frédéric Vallier. I'm the Secretary General of the Council of European Municipalities and Regions. And I wanted to uh, react on the uh, governance issue, of course, uh, thinking that um, the, the, there is a need to bridge uh, the different perspective, the uh, recovery plan and the Green Deal, for example, and what we have seen um, in, the, in, in the crisis is uh, a recentralization of policies in many countries that, uh, in my view, was counter benefit to uh, the resolution of uh, many, uh, many issues. Uh, and although now we see that uh, a lot of uh, central governments are consulting uh, regions and, uh, and cities, they are still not really involving them in, uh, in the appropriate answers uh, in, in many cases. And, um, and, and so my question or my reflection would uh, be on the relations between decisions that are taken in Brussels by the Commission or uh, supported by the Parliament and uh, the capacity to reach out to uh, the territories. Uh, how do we uh, ensure that the, um, the, the re recovery plan will be based on local development uh, and, and, and green development uh, in, in the different territories? Uh, a colleague uh, mentioned the question of uh, the tire company in, in France uh, that will be uh, shut down. Mm. But uh, uh, there are many sectors that are, uh, uh, in a way, irrelevant when we speak about green, uh, green economy. 
but uh, how do we bridge that so that we ensure that the territories uh, are uh, fit to uh, ensure their own development for their citizens and for their economy, uh, sure. and, 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 and that Europe can, uh, can reach out to, 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 to this. Okay, uh, Frederic, Frederic uh, tell me, because it chimes with what we as a think tank have put out earlier this year, is the concept of a new localism. That actually that the EU should perhaps share power more and make sure they engage mayors and territories, as you call them, much more effectively in the sharing of decisions, but also, I suppose, or even involving in the process of understanding what it is. Exactly. What level... What level of engagement have you had? And also, if you if you you've got this audience here, what can you what what support do you need to make this happen? Because actually, when we see what's happening in the UK recently, but also we, we, what's going to happen to municipality budgets in the next five years, you're going to be broke. Yeah, yeah. In fact, yeah, uh, the first lockdown um, um, uh, lowered uh, the uh, income of municipalities in Europe by twenty percent uh, just in spring. And okay. of course, we expect much more in, in, in the coming month. Uh, yeah. But what, what we would like is, uh, and, and, and I think the Commission is, uh, is pretty much uh, convinced of that, is that the, 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 the plans, the recovery plans that, that are developed are uh, discussed uh, with the uh, uh, representatives of cities and regions uh, uh -huh. in, in, in different states and that uh, the okay. solutions are local, uh, localized in, in a way. Uh, so that it's not only about uh, um, uh, uh, big economy, or, uh, uh, but okay. really that it reaches how to bring up uh, local, uh, local uh, consumption, uh, of produce, uh, how to support sure. the, the, the local so Frederick, uh, investors. Yeah, I understand and, that. And Sorry to cut kind of across you. I've got a little bit of time. I've only got a little bit of time. Sure, but I suppose sure. on your chat, on, on the function, could you just put down what you think, if, if you are having success, which is good to know that you're being heard, say what else should be happening, because you've got a group of people here that can actually bolster some of that thinking and, and make a new, a new localism work. Charlene, Charlene Burton. Hi, hello. Hello. I'm Shirley Burton. I'm the, the director of a non-profit uh, uh, search for common ground. We do peace building, uh, uh -huh. mostly outside okay. Europe, but I think some of the lessons can be also uh, applicable to, to Europe itself. So the point I wanted to make is really uh, when it comes to trust building is, is about this need to really connect the citizens uh, with the elite. And we're seeing that in, in a large majority of, of European citizens, there is really a lack of understanding of, of the EU institutions themselves, how they work, how decision sure. is made, and, uh, and there is a need to, to work on this, on making the, Euro, uh, the European Union more uh, closer to the citizens. What's your idea? What's your idea? My idea, you? thank you. Yeah, so the idea on. I would offer is really into uh, creating space for dialogue and for feedback. Uh, bringing the decision makers closer to their constituencies and ensuring that there is uh, that Europe is put on national television debates, uh, that European uh, decision makers, uh, MEPs, go closer to their constituency okay. and open debates, which is really not happening. And I think there is a, a lot of work to be done as well on the social media, uh, on using this opportunity of social media. It has this negative size, but can also be used better to, to go and talk to the different uh, elements of, of the constituency, the different groups and subgroups, it's really perceived as a uh, elite and, and there is a need to, okay. to work on bringing this closer to the different uh, subgroups of the European citizens and, and population. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Wayne, Wayne Rab. Good morning, a very warm welcome to you. Good morning, can you hear me? Good morning, yes. Please do introduce yourself, welcome. Uh, welcome. I'm, I'm Wayne Robbie. I'm the director of interagency partnering for U.S. European Command, and I've really enjoyed uh, the presentations and the discussions this morning. I, I just want to second Kristen Meyer's comments, both on chat and in, during his intervention. In my current position and for the last 20 years, uh, I have found that overcoming the obstacles uh, to coordination within government, between governments, and between government and industry has sadly been a full-time job. Yes. Um, during moments of crisis, we readily abandon our silos of excellence and work together. But when the crisis abates, we tend to crawl back into our silos 
because that is where we are all more comfortable. And I think if we can work to break that, uh, that practice, we'll all be a lot better off. Thank you. Wayne, you make a very good point, and we've made this also as a think tank, is that one of the things that we've witnessed in this crisis is the lack of leadership cap capability but preparedness to respond to the, 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 the agile, dynamic sense of change that was taking place. And when you think about the numbers I quoted earlier on about the, uh, the finances, there isn't a single leader in Europe or the world that's encountered this level of economic um, shock. No one's ever experienced it So currently in the world. So there's something about how do you learn together or create the circumstances for some of these leaders at a national and municipal level to really think differently about the fact that we don't know about what we're going to do, but we need to work together to find a pathway. And some of you have come up with some uh, ideas, but also there's something about scenario planning around this that needs to happen. I want to move to uh, one of our Generation Y, uh, Esmat contributors. Esmat. Hey everybody i'm really happy to be among just everybody here who comes from international organizations and decision making positions so it might widen our Let's perspective introduce yourself again because we just missed that go on uh, can you hear me yeah now i can yes okay perfect I'm, I'm really happy to be on this table where there are a lot of people coming from international organizations and decision making positions and i'm happy that the previous speakers have touched on the issue of hate speech uh, and polarization, there is not much left for me here to say. I okay. have written my master's thesis about political hate discourse and how it demonstrates othering and polarization um, in different European societies. I took my case study on the United Kingdom and how that led to the UK um, Brexit vote uh, sure. results. What I wanted to say is that othering and hate speech right now is being used on different levels, mainly on, on technological, using technology on the internet, on social media. Yeah. Okay. In order to promote polarization. And I think one critical solution for that would be to actually focusing on the youth initiatives that are working on the intercultural dialogue and the integration programs that are led by young people, because we are talking about uh, needing to put the society together, but also young people are the ones who are... Uh, okay. the so what you're saying is that the EU could fund or perhaps support much more the kind of, uh, the kind of approach that uh, Chris uh, DeMaia was actually talking about as well, uh, in terms of building bridges, but also creating a different narrative. One, if you can be brief, when you look at the leadership right now in Europe, what word comes to your mind? Divided. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Camilla Sultanova, can I invite you to come into this forum? Yes. Can you one hear me? Europe yes, one of our European young leaders. Thank you very much. I need you to be brief as I'm running out of time, I'm afraid. Exactly. Yes, my name is Camilla. I'm, I'm work here from Helsinki, Finland, um, EOYL 2015, and workforce diversity consultant and public speaker. Uh, I do agree with everything also said just now, as Matt, on youth engagement and bottom-up approach to empowerment. My key argument is as an immigrant, as an international student with different identities to thrive and to really believe in European identity and project and our unity is social capital exchange. And mm -hmm. I work with it on to promote diversity inclusion in Nordic countries. And what we see is in a tight knit communities, when we are in a, a risky situation as it is right now, we tend to really close up. But what really makes the trust ripple is that we have mentoring programs. We have a real funding for uh, projects that make us believe that, hey, we can trust ourselves and each other. So I do argue that um, community building is nothing without specific funding for social capital exchange initiatives. That is nothing fluffy, but it has really long-term measurable impact of um, what creates ecological safety in a local community, how to navigate the elite's public space, and how to really find your personal agency um, in talking person uh, policy making language. So let's do much more social capital um, visible, share it, and really work for our trust building um, challenges and, and so solutions. Camilla, thank you for that. And it's, it's unfortunate that when, we, when, when leaders will be thinking about, let's say they're listening to you, they'll think, oh my God, what a lot of fluff. And that's not going to actually lead to any hard results. And it's about how do you make people realize that 
that is the grit and the soul of community. And actually, without investing in it, we're not going to get anywhere. But that's what that's the kind of the hard sell. We need to change the narrative on that or the let's say yeah. the selling points on that. I want to invite G Goris before I turn back to some of our contributors. G, if I've got your name right, I do apologize if I haven't. I can't hear you. You yeah. need to go. No, no, I, I, I unmuted. Yes, you, you're close enough. Uh, so I'm uh, a long serving journalist. I've been uh, heading uh, media in Belgium for, uh, for 30 years. <coughs> what and I want to name, bring in. Sorry, because I sort of. And your name, because I think I pronounced it wrongly. Yeah. No, no, the name was Key Horis, and that's. Key so Horis. what you said was close enough. Um, <laughs> What I just wanted to bring in briefly is uh, I, I'm not so much given as other participants to go the psychological road and, and trying to understand and trying to build trust. I think what we need more uh, focus on is on the role of civil society. It hasn't been mentioned even in the past hour and a half. Uh, we're talking about power, we're talking about governance, and we don't talk about civil society, which is the space in which regular citizens, people, workers, mothers come together and build power. Because if we don't create power for the for the citizens, then mm -hmm. they will not figure in, in uh, governance, either on national or on EU or international levels. So I would think if we want to move forward on taxation, for instance, or on, uh, on, on inclusive societies, we will need to invest more in, in a vibrant and a forward-looking civil society. That's all. Sure. Great. That's a good idea. But I suppose the case is that whether um, that will actually have uh, any traction, whether, you know, if the, there's been a lot of talk about the, you know, the Conference of Future uh, of Europe. Um, anyone remember that? Uh, where's that gone? There's a policy uh, initiative. But that was meant to be the big, you know, white hope, if you like, in terms of transforming the connection between institutions and citizens. Perhaps we need to rethink that future, that conference of the future of Europe, and think about civil society as an engagement tool. I want to turn to some of our contributors, and particularly, if I can go bring Paul, Paul, back to you. You've heard a lot. Um, any kind of thoughts you want to share, or actually put on the table what you think uh, in terms of what you've heard, we can do. How can this august group of people on screen help you? Paul? Uh, thank you. I Domanda. know you weren't expecting that. No, no, it's fine. I, I think a lot has been said that I find interesting and, and, and useful. Um, I also have a question. And, uh, um, I, Paul Taylor put us to the point that we need to think about um, which industries to protect or not. And this is one of the big uh, the big question marks. Where do we end up in the end of the COVID uh, crisis? And I'm not ready to think that we go to a new normal, in a sense. Um, that would a new normal would mean that we have a oh, Saturday evening in the theater and just one third of the places was occupied. A new normal would apparently mean that we can't go dancing anymore. So I don't think we, I'm ready to accept that. I think we need to find ways forward, quick testing, maybe one of the, uh, one of the game changers. Um, uh, but I also like to think what is, what is normal will look like. I think that's crucial if you want to have a debate on where to go. Uh, if you talk about leadership, you have to have an understanding where to go. Mm. And um, this is, so this is a question uh, I have. I don't have uh, it fully figured out. But I also make this point because don't, let, don't abandon people. If we have discussions about trust and community building, but one spoke, a moment people feel left down, feel left behind, this trust breaks down, the communities will break down. And I don't think we should um, decide too soon on, uh, on, on uh, diminishing support for, uh, for, for jobs and, uh, and workers for, uh, for this reason. Um, and I bring back a question because I, what I like about this session is there are a lot of people here that, that want to discuss, bring different elements, but this is also what we need to have in our discussion. How will this uh, crisis evolve, and uh, to what normal will it will it uh, will it bring us? Because that's an important question that leader the leadership in general has to deal with. 
Paul, I wonder, you know, because one of the things in my experience of working in Scotland with the Scottish government was that you've got the, each committee would take lots of evidence and continually engage civil society in its deliberations uh, each time. Are you doing that? Because we've heard from various people about civil society groups, young people, etc. Can you imagine the power of filling a Zoom audience around tax matters in, in your subcommittee? Will you do that? Are you, have you done that? Uh, yeah, I, I, a lot of people take interest. Um, one of the, you know, I mean, will uh, you actually proactively construct that opportunity? Oh, would you do that? Uh, yeah, I, I think one of the uh, what I would like to see is for the subcommittee on uh, on tax matters. I would like to see as a as a hub in European discussions, and to bring this discussion not just in Brussels but also take it outside Brussels. So I very much okay. this is this is what the new technology may bring us that we can also move the discussion to uh, to the member states to to the capitals and let people uh, let uh, let people join. My problem that I have as a politician is that. Mm -hmm. um, not everyone participates in a Zoom meeting. So this meeting sure. is usually uh, for people with, uh, uh, with, that are high skills, well-educated. But uh, the members of my football club, uh, I speak them there. I don't see them on, in a Zoom meeting, right? No, sure, Paul. Uh, 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 my issue is that we, we know, I mean, we're all, this is not about a, a blank sheet or we're not ingenue. That's the key point about there's a massive civil society sector out there in Europe. You could work through them and get them to host meetings and be able to then directly engage on tax matters. It doesn't have to be the, through the medium of Zoom. It could be any other medium. But can you imagine the power of you opening up that space for a conversation across Europe around the future of tax? And that would also perhaps deal with some of the, the issues that we're dealing with from members states and others. Uh, something for you to think about. Before I move on to our next speaker, we have a um, Tonu's cartoon for you to reflect on um, for a moment. Um, pretty, well, it's fun, depressing, but um, hopefully that's not the image of the future. It's an image of the past and where we are, but let's hope that we get somewhere more optimistic. Neri, over to you uh, in terms of yeah. uh, any thoughts you have. And I, you know, Neri, I, be, if you can, as challenging and as provocative as you want in terms of asking here, if people need to vote on something through their chat function, their virtual hand, or, or just come up with a bold idea that, you know, let's do this or a set of the ideas. And I know I'm setting you up for a lot, but. Okay, so two quick positive thoughts to, to finish. Yeah. Um, one is um, one big issue. Paul Taylor raised it, and others. Um, how do how do how should European governments invest? Should they support zombie jobs or support a new economy? Very clearly, what governments should be doing is when they use bailout money, when they support business, when they support jobs, is to help European businesses adapt. Help those small restaurants compete with Deliveroo. Help those small shops compete with Amazon use the money to help European business actually compete with those American giants that you that you mentioned, but also to adapt. And I think there was a sweet spot in there. Second, the other big theme this morning was about the polarization. Um, and COVID is exacerbating that because one thing mm. my, my social psychology colleagues show us in Oxford is that interaction is crucial. If you fragment people, if you have the wealthy in one part of town, the poor in another, if you have Bangladeshi immigrants in one part of town and unemployed white um, populations in another, you will create huge division. And there is a positive mm. solution, which is integrate. And a lot mm. of people have commented on that. Integrated schools, integrated daycare centers, don't take refugees and put them all in the poorest town because that's the cheapest place to put them. Integrate them across communities with the resilience to actually absorb them. And I think there's some positive examples of that. Look at what Singapore does with social housing. Let me finish with one last point about perceptions of the other. I saw some very positive news the other day about Democrats and Republicans in the United States. And the bad news is that each think that the other perceive them as truly evil, truly the devil. The positive news was that in fact, the perceptions of the other are not, nowhere near as bad as people imagine. And so there is a common ground there to build on. So to me, um, what Europeans are going to have to do is not be too complacent about the European model. Look outside of Europe for solutions. Don't just focus. I think a number of people said that in a crisis, countries look inward and so too mm. perhaps the European Union. 
And now is the time to break out of that, to ask, you know, why is Vietnam doing well on COVID? You know, what are other countries and other regions doing well on, whether it's on social housing or social cohesion, and to learn lessons from across the world. That's certainly what we try and do in the Blavatnik School of Government here in Oxford. Nari, thank you very much for that. Very helpful and, 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 and striking an optimistic tone and note in terms of what we need to do and think about as we move ahead. Um, that's it, colleagues, I'm afraid, uh, for this session. Time has run out. But as I said, please do use the chat function. Continue to make comments on that and share. But, you know, what I want to uh, you know, conclude by where I st started about the shrinking of the global economy. I just can't, you know, under, you know, I just want to over uh, overemphasize the point of the shrinking of that economy economy by 8%, as I said, 5%, which is the largest since Second World War. And I think the reason why I'm saying that is that we really need to rethink the fact that, and not disbelief, that our econo economic structures are being restructured for us. And when we think about digitalization and the fact that, you know, the big tech companies have won the biggest shares, I mean, phenomenal. How do you reorientate that, that gain and think about sustainable, inclusive, uh, development into the future. Colleagues, it's been a real pleasure to involve you. Keep, keep uh, and continue this conversation with us and join us in um, the range of sessions that we have in this week. This was the beginning. And I think these topics of leadership, governance and trust will actually underpin a lot of the debates um, throughout the week. Thank our contributors also for your wise words and also for stimulating uh, our useful thinking uh, in this regard. Um, and stay tuned. Go to our website. Go back to your app on hashtag State of, EU, uh, State of Europe uh, in terms of where you've plugged in for the next session that we've got planned uh, and look forward to seeing you again. Thank you all very much for your time. Keep safe, keep your distance and see you again in a very short while for those who've been able to join us. Thank you very much and goodbye.